Good morning. Can everyone hear me okay? Test, test. Are we good? A little louder. A request for a bit more volume. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, it's really, really nice to be here for my, uh, uh, this is my second Libra Planet. I just couldn't miss it the um, uh, second time around. It's, it's uh, certainly on my schedule for the next few years and things like that. Let me get this mouse cursor out of the way. Um, so today I'm going to talk. Oh, hello. Today I'm talk to you about uh, uh, Redis Labs licenses and things like that. I'm unfortunately I'm probably going to um, ask more questions than answer them. Um, it's sort of quite meandering and things like that. But so let's just jump straight in, really. Um, uh, does everyone? I mean, who am I? My name's Chris Lau. I've. Um, who is that? I live in the other Cambridge. Um, it does not look like this today. It's um, yeah. Uh, well, even this Cambridge doesn't look that nice today, so, yeah. Um, curiously, if you're from the UK, um, the other Cambridge means Oxford, you know, in a sort of Harvard, MIT kind of thing, so. Yeah, just a bit of socio-anthropological thing. Yeah, yeah. And the other Oxford is, of course, Cambridge. Um, everyone knows the concept of hats, so this is the idea that um, people do a lot of roles, in, uh, you know, they um, represent various people. Um, and people say, oh, yes, I'm wearing my um, you know, free software hat, or I'm wearing my um, company hat, or my um, sort of uh, dad hat, you know, things like that. Um, I'm not wearing any hat today. It's just me. Um, well, I'm not wearing any hat today. Um, although I was wearing this hat quite recently. So it's uh, the only hat that matters, right? Yeah. That's fun. Cool. So, I mean, today I'm going to talk to you about sort of what happened, what, what you know, Redis Labs, Commons Clause, you know, the com et cetera, et cetera. Um, why this actually matters. Um, so we're already going to generalize this quite quickly. Um, our response to what happened and things like that, and also what we can actually do. Um, as I said before, I don't really have any answers to all these questions. Um, I mean, discussions about free software sustainability in terms of economics is like, so, uh, yeah, I don't have the answer at the end of this talk, very wrapped up, like, yeah, we just need to, um, jump on this and everything will be solved and things like that, you know. Certainly not going to say UBI at anyone anyway. So, so actually, what, what actually happened? So, I mean, quickly, what is Redis? Redis is a kind of mem, if you um, used to write sort of Perl and other things, uh, used to use things like memcache, sorry. It's pretty much like a memcache style caching server, um, but it persists to disk. Um, it's very fast, single threaded, the code's quite easy to use. Um, at the time, MySQL was really sort of bulky and Postgres wasn't really there yet. So people just jumped on, on Redis and things like that. It started in March 2009, um, and it's, as I say, heavily used in web development. You can use it for um, horizontally scaling across multiple web servers and things like that. Uh, license under the BSD. Uh, Redis Search is um, a, a search engine module for um, Redis, uh, Redis eventually grew a module system, you know, it's sort of classic, you have a, a core, and then you can sort of load in modules at runtime uh, for extra functionality. For example, um, a full text search indexing. Um, and this is initially released under the Afro GPL, the AGPL, um, great. Um, and Redis Labs are the authors of the, founded in 2010, authors of these uh, modules and things like that. And they sort of fund um, Redis conferences, development in that area. So they're kind of like the Redis shop. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, that kind of thing. Uh, and they launched their own cloud-hosted um, version of Redis in 2013. So you don't have to maintain uh, Redis servers yourself. You can go ahead and um, sort of use theirs and things like that. So there's kind of like personas going on like that. So the rough timeline is that um, I, used, I did some contributions towards um, quite a few towards Redis itself, but more saliently towards um, the search engine module Redis Search. And, um, you know, great, this turns him upstream and things like that, because I was also the Debian maintainer for, um, uh, for the Redis Search modules and Redis itself. And uh, so I got an email saying, uh, thanks for your contributions. You've made to Redis Search. We hope you'll find the project useful and you continue to help us improve it. Okay, cool. Due to the license that the project uses, AGPL, we require that you sign a contributed license agreement. Please, re please reply with a signed version at your earliest convenience. Um, okay, so could you elaborate why, what, what, 
What's um, why are you using the HPL now? Need a CLA? What's what's going on? Um, there's no relevance. The CLA just grants us the special permission to, uh, to use the contributions as we see fit. Like, okay, okay. But um, well, with a CLA, you can make proprietary forks. You know, uh, it seems somewhat odd with the sort of um, ethos of the AGPL to sort of centrally assign copyright because any the sort of AGPL part can be sort of pulled out underneath you and things like that. But honestly, sir, you have no intention of doing anything like that. Um, have to ask the lawyers, but yeah, no intention of relicensing whatsoever. Um, uh, but the company would like to reserve the option to, to change the license in the future. Okay. Mm. Okay, so I signed the CLA. I mean, I, my contributions were quite small. They were just sort of like, um, oh, there's some sort of warning when you build it on this rather esoteric Debian architecture. So, okay, whatever. Maybe it wasn't even copyrightable to begin with. Okay, moving on. Um, they actually get relicensed. So surprise, um, yeah. So great. Um, so the the modules themselves. This is not the server. Got relicensed under what's called uh, what they referred to at the time was the Apache license two, uh, with the Commons clause. So this is the Apache license with this sort of um, license amendment attached to it. Um, things like that. So what is the Commons clause? What what is it saying? So it applies a narrow mineral form commercial restriction on top of the existing license. So you have a, a nice free software license like the Apache license, and then you basically say sort of all of that is great, but uh, yeah, non-commercial, fair use, something, 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 something. In practice, Commons clause only adds a limitation concerning fair use. We believe that both licensing approaches share the same core value of making software available for use by anyone. Okay, yeah. So what's the rationale here? Cloud providers have repeatedly taken advantage of successful open source projects and repackaged them into competitive proprietary service offering offerings. They use their monopolistic nature to derive hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue from them, and this behavior has damaged open source communities and put some of the companies that support them out of business. So that's, you know, that's the rationale from their point of view. They feel pushed against the wall um, by um, large cloud providers um, and feel like they aren't seeing the return on the investment that they that they wish to see, that they wish to to get from being part of this ecosystem. Um, unfortunately, um, that's um, uh, even behind the times because in February um, they relicensed again under something called the um, the Redis Lab Source Available License, which is kind of quite interesting. But um, yeah. Uh, apparently, the quote literally was confusion whether the modules were open. So, yeah. so what's the actual problem here? Something gets relicensed, great, okay, well, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, let's take a slight um, detour into the four freedoms. Um, perhaps when you were young, you played Game Boys, uh, sort of co handheld console games, and you might have picked up one of those pirated um, uh, cartridges from, um, from Japan or something like that, that had sort of 32 games in one or 100 games in one, um, that were all terrible. Uh, the four freedoms are nothing like that whatsoever. Each one of them is brilliant. So starting down at number four um, is, of course, the uh, uh, freedom to distribute copies of modified versions. Um, number three, shall I say, number two, uh, <laughs> to redistribute copies. Um, freedom one, to study how the program works, but the one we care about today is to run the program as you wish for any purpose whatsoever. Um, and so typically, um, people like to uh, restrict licenses from being used in military research, uh, genetic research, or things that they find ethically questionable. Um, and sort of generally non-commercial, because people have a sort of gut feel against, like, I don't want my work to be, <laughs> words are used like exploited and things like that, or taken advantage of, and things like that. Um, there are also some quite explicit new uh, licenses in this area. But, uh, there's a license called the No Harm License, which is just a BSD license, but you can't use it for anything that uses violence, hate, environmental destruction, you know, things like that. All of these things are quite bad. Um, I hope you agree. Um, well, I'm, I'm telling you, they're bad. Violence is bad. TIL. Um, so yeah, um, that's applied on top of an existing license and things like that. Uh, one problem here is that we always tend to frame this as a question of definition. So we say, well, you know, um, for example, uh, you're in a band, 
and uh, you, you write some music and things like that, and you want everyone, as, as many people as possible, to use it. But you don't want um, people to take advantage of your work, or just um, they want you to still attend your gigs or um, not um, appropriate you, the, your hard, hard work into their own things without some sort of recognition and things like that. Or you certainly don't want um, someone to s perhaps sell CDs of your work and you see no return on that. So you think using something like the Creative Commons non-commercial uh, license is appropriate for that kind of thing. And people say, no, no, that's not a good idea. Um, because, I mean, what if someone wants to make sort of t-shirts of your album artwork? Is that commercial? Is that non-commercial? Ooh, who, who knows? I mean, yeah, things like that. And so um, the sort of uh, the conversation in this area is often framed around uh, whether what would actually count as commercial or non-commercial and things like that rather than talking about like, the underlying value of why you would want as many people um, to, use your, uh, to use your output or your, your hard work uh, as possible and to you know, redistribute copies, to do uh, cool remixes and things like that. Things like that. Uh, yeah, just can people make t-shirts based on your artwork? You know, this, and that's sort of how it's always framed in terms of, well, you know, we don't really know um, whether it's, this would count as non-commercial or not. I mean, so, I mean, one question we should always be asking is, like, what is the true purpose of freedom zero? It's not to avoid um, these sort of definitional problems or, like, oh, well, you know, is that non-commercial? Um, is that fair use and things like that? Um, we often lose sight of why we allow or we promote the idea of um, to be able to run software for any purpose whatsoever. Um, also encapsulated in terms of the um, open source definition number six, which is um, discrimination against fields of endeavor. You know, wh why we, not, we need to really uh, remind ourselves constantly why we are interested in, and invested in that um, ethos and things like that. So, I mean, ooh, um, so what, yeah, the other problem here is that um, the, a bunch of um, rather poor narratives are being pushed here, lots of conversations, um, things. For example, when people talk about sort of source availability, it completely misses the point of software freedom and user freedom. Um, if, okay, you have the source code for something, great, but you can't change it and, you know, to help your neighbor and things like that. So it's not respecting your freedoms and it's not letting you um, contribute to your community at large. Um, it also um, <clears throat> pushes the narrative that free software cannot be so, um, financially self-sustaining. I know a number of people here, I can see them, uh, make their living from free software and um, would love, love to continue doing that. But if you have um, large people making big press releases saying like, oh, we can't actually sustain uh, companies in the, in the free software space, um, that sort of puts people off trying, you know, sort of investing their time and energy into learning about our um, community and things like that. Um, the other problem here was that obviously there's sort of um, uh, com what I call commons washing. Perhaps you've uh, come across the concept of green washing where um, like perhaps large oil companies will use green logos and associate themselves with very nice things like that. And it's sort of um, what's usually cynically, ref um, as a sort of rather cynical gesture really. And it's called greenwashing because you're taking something that's quite nasty and you're sort of running it through a sort of greenwash and now everything is amazing. So you know, things like that. Um, and there's also sort of appropriation of um, terms. The um, Creative Commons endeavor is, has a lot of goodwill attached to it. And so if you use something with the word commons, uh, you sort of are slightly, um, uh, what would you call it, um, appropriating their, their goodwill and things like that. Um, as you know, terms and stuff, oh, uh, um, terms for us are quite um, problematic, free, open, et cetera, et cetera. So um, did we need more conflation of terms? Mm, I don't think so. So yeah, having a sort of commons clause um, and, and particularly the, the commons attached to it was a little bit um, uh, problematic, let's put it that way. Um, in fairness, Redis Labs said um, best not to call commons clause software open source. Um, okay, that's what they actually say in the, what they've said in various press releases. Um, unfortunately, for many, many months, their website still claimed that the, the uh, modules themselves were remaining open source when they clearly were not because the um, Apache with the Commons clause attached to it is not a 
free software or open source license. Uh, the other problem here is that distributions can't ship the software. Debian has the Debian free software guidelines. Um, Arch Linux, uh, Fedora is pretty um, uh, keen on software freedom and things like that. So, um, sorry, this is a little bit, uh, just thank you. Um, distributions can't distribute the software. Um, so, um, so, for example, um, I had to request that Redis search was removed from Debian. Um, and so this prevents users from actually using the software. Uh, they, they'd have to go upstream and download it themselves, compile it themselves, support it themselves. This doesn't sound like something that we want to do. It doesn't really, you're not really helping your neighbor in that sense. Um, Relicensing of this sort also pushes away community contributions. And um, quite explicitly, people were saying, I won't contribute to anything Redis related. Um, and certainly I have no intention of contributing to Redis search upstream when it's not under a free software license. What's the point? Um, things like that. Um, and now I'd like to talk a little bit more about our response to what happened. I mean, one thing that's, um, I think, quite important to um, keep in mind is that when we um, learned about these relicensing things, um, we actually kind of quite essentially failed to get them to relicense, um, which you relicense back to a free software license. So um, whatever we did, I don't think we were successful um, because they, they did not say, oh, okay, this is, this is a bad idea or we've sort of been shamed into, not shamed, but um, <laughs> the, the, the modules still remain uh, under a non-free license. So whatever we did in our response, we, we weren't effective enough. And I think it's worth uh, spending a little while working out why that happened or um, perhaps working out what we could do better in the future. I mean, one thing we did wrong was our response was quite overly legalistic. So for example, we immediately just jumped out and said, yep, it's not open source license, moving on. Like things like that. Um, also, we, um, we use definitions the whole time and things like that. Um, again, it's sort of um, confusing the difference between freedom zero and being like, well, it's just a question of, you know, it'd be very difficult to define what non-commercial is. It's very difficult to define what fair use is. You know, what if I use this complicated CLA thing? Is, does that count under this verbiage and things like that? You know, I'm not a lawyer, blah, 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 things like that. I think that really misses the point about, like, why we are doing this thing, why we're invested in free software to begin with. Um, it's not because we're trying to satisfy a list of um, four freedoms or um, the open source definition. We, we have something, there's something deeper going on there. Um, Aristotle said, um, always work from the general to the specific. Um, in this case, we did the exact opposite. We started at specific things saying, yes, and it doesn't fit this definition. And we didn't talk about the generalities of why we are here to begin with, things like that. Um, we also, this also confuses the concept of morality and legality. If you sort of squint and you assume that um, uh, the free software guidelines, the open source definition, and the four freedoms are a sort of legalistic um, way of looking at it. Uh, we uh, completely omitted the morality part of it as well. And um, as everyone is probably aware, there's often a bit of slippage between morality and legality. We, aren't, we weren't wrong, of course, by saying that it didn't match up with the four freedoms or the open source definition. It's just that it's not necessarily an effective way of getting your message across because you aren't actually saying that, oh, um, like you aren't actually going to try and convince someone emotionally that they, um, that they should change or things like that. There's certainly, certainly much more effective strategies for changing people's minds. Uh, Aristotle, again, in his Art of Rhetoric, he says, you know, play on people's emotions and things like that if you want to change their mind and things like that. Uh, one book I read recently um, was uh, Thinking Fast and Slow where he talks about two different systems of thinking. One, system one, which is automatic, fast, and unconscious. Um, and this um, typically is quite an emotional-led response. Um, so it's certainly subject to bias and, um, and things like that, and you can um, certainly abuse it and things like that. Um, but this is where a lot of conversations happen. People hear um, things and immediately process them with system, say, system one thinking, as it's called. And there's system two thinking, which is sort of apparently effortful, slow and controlled. It's a bit more um, what we might typically call rational um, and things like that. And um, our responses were perhaps more in the system two thing. And if our response was more in the system one, uh, we may have been more effective in terms of 
um, changing people's minds in a, in a real meaningful sense. Uh, the other problem we did was conflated Redis itself and Redis labs and the modules. So for example, a bunch of people said, um, oh, Redis is, um, I'm trying to remember yet, Redis is no longer open source. Well, Redis, the server itself, still remains BSD, but the modules uh, were relicensed and things like that. So we sort of did our own conflation of terms on top of their conflation of terms with the commons clause and things like that. Um, and again, more sort of conflation of terms here as well. We also sort of somewhat attacked the messenger here. Uh, if Redis labs felt they were pushed up against the wall by la large cloud providers, uh, I happen to name one of them here, why was our response typically aimed at Redis labs themselves and not saying, well, we sort of, we see what you mean, but I mean, um, I hear that Jeff Bezos has a few um, spare billions or something, so to, to attack Redis and not um, critique Amazon at all uh, was perhaps missing the point in some areas. Um, if they've, um, one, one typical um, complaint about Amazon is they essentially sort of strip mining free software and open source projects and communities. Um, and, but if we, we just generally tend to attack the people who are, um, feel like they are um, <clears throat> forced into making various decisions and things like that and not going after the root causes here. If we solve the root causes, maybe less of these companies would start to relicense, perhaps. So what can we do about it? I mean, we can start to, um, I mean, in quite practical terms, we can fork um, uh, these projects. Um, and I did that with um, Nathan Scott from Fedora. Uh, what we did is we took the, um, the, the previous commit that was under a free software license, and we now maintain our own free software um, fork and keep it under the AGPL. And you can get that from good form code. Uh, is this really a sort of sustainable ongoing thing? Can we really provide all the security maintenance? Um, we certainly don't have time to keep it at feature parity, and we'd have to, have to be very careful about sort of copying features back in. Do you see what I mean? You know, sort of clean room, all of those concerns and things like that, you come across that. Um, so I'm not sure we can always fork everything uh, when large um, projects uh, relicense and things like that. And we can also we can just say no and not use various things. So for example, we can just not use Redis search. Um, I used it once, and obviously I'm not sure I would recommend to use it uh, from other companies now. Uh, to if anyone asked me as a freelancer or something like that, um, I would say you know, perhaps. Perhaps something else might be a little bit more up your street, certainly a little more up my street. We could not use Redis. We could just say, I'm out of this ecosystem whatsoever. It's kind of a useful piece of software, and the server remains BSD. But if you're using the server, are you sort of half promoting the sort of um, community um, stroke ecosystem around um, the non free modules? Perhaps, perhaps. So, yeah. Um, you can don't adopt these licenses if you're in a position to. Um, to, to um, uh, you know, you, you own one of these companies and things like that. You could obviously just not relicense your things under non-free licenses. Yeah. Um, don't centrally assign copyright. Uh, that's perhaps uh, one mistake here. If all the copyright is centrally assigned, um, large projects can just be relicensed overnight uh, without your consent. So uh, I recommend that people don't centrally assign copyright unless they really trust who you are are um, assigning it to. And obviously, if you're a lawyer, please don't write these licenses. Thanks. Um, I think we could communicate more. Um, did anyone talk to Redis Labs before they actually relicensed? Uh, would we have listened if they you know, talked to us as a community? Uh, I don't know of anyone doing sort of proactive outreach to companies in this space. Uh, if, if we did, um, what would we hear? What would we do anything about it? Um, I mean, it w would we have listened, um, things like that? Um, as I say, even when, we, um, even when we did talk to them, they still kept uh, various problematic phrases on the website for many months afterwards, things like that. Uh, we could um, perhaps write better, newer licenses that address some of these concerns. What would an AGPL v4 look like? What would it have inside it? I don't know the answer. Um, an ALGPL, well, that was talked about fairly recently. License zero, SSPL version, what are we up to now? Three, four? 
Um, there's all these sort of new-ish licenses that perhaps might, might help in this area. We'll have to see things like that. Uh, I'm not sure it'll under ha happen without sort of what we might call understanding business, or at least understanding their concerns, speaking to their fears, learning their fears. Um, if it's just a question of like, um, if we keep approaching it in terms of whether this technically matches a, a list of checkbox items on a website, whether it's something is a free software project or not, I'm not sure we'll really get there without under, really emotionally understanding why people are making these decisions and changing their licenses. Um, we could certainly write and author better narratives and stories in this area, um, to use more Aristotle. He says when you know making a good argument, a good rhetoric includes elements like logic, um, using maxims and phrases, uh, use evidence and examples from um, past from history, and present as an honest person in ethos and things like that. So I mean, don't um, uh, don't lie, don't uh, pretend that um, everything would happen if you can just be as honest as possible. Um, this certainly is um, helps you um, have what. Aristotle also called pathos in terms of like understanding where they're coming from and things like that. We could push our own narratives as well. Um, for example, we should foreground and highlight anyone doing sustainable development in free software. Um, any companies that are um, particularly interested and um, really dedicated to being um, a responsible member of the community, always giving back and things like that. Um, we should talk about them a lot more and trumpet what they're doing. Uh, we, yeah, things like that. Uh, certainly, you know, allow them into our conference spaces, you know, give them, let them speak at uh, talks and things like that. Um, and just say, look, like, you can actually make money in free software and it benefits everyone and it's great, so let's do more of this. Uh, we could background relicensing stories. Redis Search isn't that big a bit of code. It's not, like, world-changing. It's not, you know... Um, it's not going to be on, um, you know, CNN that evening. So, in some senses, we can just sort of slightly ignore what's going on. Be like, yeah, okay, don't don't, don't make a big deal out of it, right? We could do that. Um, certainly, highlight um, successes of AGPL projects. Um, we certainly write more AGPL projects, um, and we should also highlight any time when something gets relicensed back from being non-free to free. Um, and we should um, applaud anyone that makes that decision and things like that and make a big, a big fuss about that. Things like that. So, yeah, um, yeah, I don't have any, as I say, I don't have any solutions to the, um, the problem of uh, sustainable free software development and things like that. And I've asked more questions than I've answered. But um, I thank you for listening to me. Hopefully, I've um, explained a bit about the history of what happened here because it got a bit complicated at times. Um, so if there's any questions, I'd be very happy to take them. Um, but um, I'd like to thank you for being here so early in the morning. Thank you. Uh, Sam Hartman, so I guess I have a couple of comments that I would ask you to consider. Um, the first is that I've actually, my experience has been that meeting system type one thinking, um, sort of that, using that approach to something that you're upset about, um, can often lead to a very system type one response from the other party where both sides dig in pretty quickly. Um, I think you and I have personally experienced a little bit about that at the beginning of this year. Um, and I think that if you, if you meet um, an emotional response, you know, basically if you have an emotional response and that's where you lead, um, without developing empathy and connection with the other side, 
that you basically you can just get very strong system type one emotional responses in both directions and get very quickly to a position where forward progress is hard. So in response to that, I would recommend that you kind of, in your list, perhaps move up the understand their needs, you know, to be a much higher priority in, um, in the process, in the, the, um, the, the list. Um, my second brief point is that one thing we can do is we can create enough, enough contributions as a community. Yes, with a CLI, they can take our existing contributions, um, and that's certainly a negotiation to have. But they know that, you know, they're going to lose our future contributions. And, you know, if there are enough contributions coming in from the community, um, the cost of doing that can be high enough that it doesn't make sense to disband the community. Thank you. I, I agree. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Ira Cooper. I work in this stuff for a bit. Um, I would argue that don't your trust of the company that holds the CLA makes absolutely no difference because they could be bought tomorrow. Witness um, Sun Microsystems, who is, eh, okay. And then witness being bought by Oracle, who I'd say, yes. So yeah. in doing, I'll use those two as an example. There's a thousand and one others that you can go pull. If you have any doubts about CLA, do not sign. Mm -hmm. And I would say that to the audience. Don't sign them if you don't have reasons to. I think um, when I mentioned about um, centrally assigning copyright, um, there'd be certainly some entities I'd be very happy to assign my copyright to. For example, the Free Software Foundation. Um, you know, I would say that, right? Um, but, um, but yes, I think you're absolutely right that um, companies can be bought tomorrow and things like that. The FSF probably won't be bought tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs> Sort of on that same note and stream, um, I think sometimes there might be value in having a central copyright, you know, entity. Um, so like a one one example, maybe not the best example, is like the Linux kernel is still GPL v2, right? And and v3 was is, is an innovation to fight certain practices and. We can't relicense GPL v2 because so many developers, some of whom are dead, you know, who won't relinquish their copyright. So, w what are options do you think for you know trusted entities like maybe the Software Freedom Conservancy or are they or the FSF or? Um, I think those are good approaches. Um, certainly, um, those are at least two organisations that I personally would be happy assigning sort of copyrights to and things like that. Um, but you're absolutely right, I mean, because people, when people license their code under GPL2 only, or without the, you know, or later clause that you're obviously well aware of, um, yes, you, the Linux kernel will be GPL2 forever, right? Um, yeah. Um, I have no solution to that. Um, and yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I'm not, what is this? I'm not sure there is one. Because, right. yeah. Unless copyright law gets turned on its head. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, uh, Jack Robertson first. Thanks for taking the time. Great presentation. Um, I think, uh, I guess his name was Sam, but I would have to agree with him in that we can talk to Redis Labs till we're blue in the face about the four freedoms, but they're going to show us our ba their balance sheet and then back to square zero. So from what you're saying, it seems like it's a question of community leadership in terms of who's actually going to go out and engage Redis Labs or anyone else that's thinking of doing the same thing. Because, I mean, they have the problems, and if they're leading a lot, of, a lot of the great tech and a lot of the great developments, they do have to pay employees. So aside from, I guess, the F FSF, are there being, are there, is there any action to go out and engage these companies? Who's leading it? Has this been thought of, et cetera? Uh, thank you. I'm not aware of any, as I said, I'm not aware of, uh, <clears throat> aware of any proactive outreach. Yeah. In that kind of sense, it's, we're very much in a responsive mode um, to any relicensing that comes up. Um, I'm not sure who would take that on. 
is it is it the FSF? Is it the OSI? I mean, is it just random people? Um, yeah. So maybe a solution would be a, uh, a forum of sorts. Uh, it's a general forum that is, uh, not a web forum. Um, uh, of these companies to sort of get together and things like that. And maybe maybe those discussions will come up early, and us as a community can, you know, perhaps latch onto that. Perhaps, but I, yeah, I'm not. I'm again, I'm not sure of, of anything that could could directly help speak to that. Yeah. Thank you. No, thank you. Hello, I'm Richard Stallman, and. Uh, I'd like to mention regarding assigning copyright to the Free Software Foundation that these contracts always let the contributor have non-exclusive rights to the contributed code, which means that you're not stopped from uh, releasing the same code in some other way if you become unhappy, if you think we put on a license that's too restricted. We also uh, make some promises about what our licenses will permit. So uh, <clears throat> it's not just that we've shown that you can trust us, but we put it right there in, in writing to give you more reasons, more, m you can trust the contract as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have, I know I heard about the Commons Clause. I don't remember after months exactly what it was, uh, but what I, what I think we can do about anyone that changes license in a bad, in a way that makes it unacceptably restrictive is we've got to organize forking. Our community has to step up and say what you've just done makes your software totally unacceptable to us in its new version. The only version we can use is that old one, so we're going to maintain that. Because this is, first of all, it's not just retaliation. It's protecting our ability to keep using the code that we've been using. So it's not arbitrary. But at the same time, it's something it, that will thwart, at least to some extent, the perpetrator of the change we don't like. So that's what I think we need to do more of. In regard to releasing programs under GPL version 2 only, all we can do is speak up more. Partly this is the fault of GitHub. GitHub gave very misleading and harmful licensing advice. GitHub has done tremendous harm to our community in this way. So bad that I am unable to, I have no expectations about whether Microsoft will make it worse or better. <laughs> when you're starting from something so bad, Thank you. Um, I guess to play devil's advocate with the, the, the first question. Um, oh, yes, thank you first for the clarification regarding um, uh, the, the copyright assignment FSF thing. I remember signing mine probably over 10 years ago, so I can't remember the details of it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, Peter Amstutz. So it seems like Redis, or Redis Labs is sort of a victim of its own success. Uh, when software reaches a certain level of quality, people can just install it and use it without ever you know, contributing back to the community. Uh, I, my company has a you know, uh, sell support for our free software uh, product. And we found that essentially you have to go out and find uh, the customers who are using your software and say, you know, you really should buy a support contract. And it essentially become enterprise software sales, which really stinks if you are uh, just want to write code. But maybe there just needs to be more understanding of like what are the actual sustainable models here. And we probably don't have a lot of transparency into what Redis, what went on between Redis and Amazon and other places. But it sounds like they sort of failed at persuading Amazon to give them some money for the value that Amazon is getting out of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, thanks for the talk. Um, one thing that I feel like might help here, um, 
I feel like, uh, and I don't have hard data about um, who the developer, who overall was contributing to the to the uh, Redis Labs, um, the modules that Redis Labs uh, was developing. But I feel like it might help if the developer community around those modules was less uh, centralized in those companies. So Redis Labs, if most of the developers for those modules worked for Redis Labs, then they, they forking that code is going to be a lot more difficult because all of a sudden the developer community, like the most of the developers are still working for Redis Labs and so they're just going to keep working on the original version. Whereas if, uh, if the developer community around those modules isn't concentrated in one company, it's a lot, they, the company has less leverage. Uh, That's absolutely right and there'll be certainly an asymmetry. If you do fork, which I promote and I've, as I say, I've forked these modules with Nathan Scott from, from Fedora, um, there's certainly an asymmetry of, of effort and um, attention from the employees that we can give them because we're just not full-time. I'm not paid full-time to work on these modules whilst they essentially are, so yeah. Um, and I have no solution to that, unfortunately, yeah. Uh, so I have a question about uh, trying to secure licenses so that they, or protect them from being relicensed. And one of the things we're talking about is assigning it to assigning the license to some other organization. Uh, but is there any way, I guess if we have a copyright, we can't say, okay, here's the GPL, uh, I'm not going to relicense it and I'm gonna make that guarantee to the community. I can't do that legally without somebody paying me something or some reasonable compensation. So is there any way or a workaround where we can do some kind of a guarantee? Is there like a way to bind that in contract form by saying, okay, uh, as a condition of giving you this, uh, uh, this software to the FSF or something, for example, that as a condition for that, you will maintain this license that becomes contractually binding. Is there any way to kind of keep a license or to guarantee that that license won't change if somebody wants something to remain under the GPL? Well, or I'm not GPL a, or whatever. unfortunately, I'm not a lawyer, um, as the, the meme goes. Um, I'm not sure. I think some people are trying um, to do that, but I think it's very difficult. It's like, perhaps like a, uh, the British Parliament can't uh, bind future parliaments to any decision. Like it's, it's, I think it's maybe something along those lines, like it's sort of um, definitionally impossible to do that. Perhaps if you use other parts of law, like contract law, um, I think a few people are playing with using trademark law to do similar things. But I mean, <laughs> licenses are really pretty complicated and trademarks are, um, yeah, as, as you know. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I don't know of any of way of you know, future binding in the way you're suggesting, yeah, but that's, that'd be one way of doing it. Um, yeah. Thank you. Cool, uh, I think this will be the last question. Thank you. Just a clarification on my previous comment. In no way do I mean to paint the FSF or the Conservancy in the same light I paint Oracle. <laughs> just saying, everybody in the room should feel clear. I think we got that, thank you. Okay, but just that's want to be explicit given, is better than implicit. Given the pre other sets of comments, I wanted to say, you know, assigned to the Conservancy, assigned to the FSF is a very different beast than assigning with CLAs at contribution time in these situations. Know which one you're getting into. Thank you, thank you. Anyway, thank you all again for um, showing up so early and uh, hope to speak to you in around the conference.